The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Managing Difficult Employees, 15 Types of Employees Who Challenge Us, presented by our sponsor Heffernan. We're so happy you can join us. My name is Amanda Ramatar, and I will be your moderator today, and I will also be monitoring questions you may have during the session. Before we open up the session, let's review a couple of key items. All of the webinar materials we discussed can be found at the URL currently showing on your screen. I will be sharing this URL in a follow-up email, so don't feel like you need to write it down right now. If you have trouble with your internet connection during the webinar, we recommend leaving the presentation and logging back in. We do not control the audio, your devices control the audio, so if you have audio difficulties, try adjusting the volume settings on your device. If a telephone line goes dead during the call, hang up and call back again to the same number. If all lines go dead, watch the on-screen chat box for an alternative call-in number. <laughs> Feel free to ask questions or provide feedback by using the chat box or questions box during the webinar. If you are using a tablet, you may need to tap on the screen for the options bar to appear, then you can select the appropriate option. We may not respond immediately, but we will work your questions or feedback into the presentation. If we can't get to your comment or question during the session, we will be online afterward to respond. <clears throat> or we may follow up in an email if we run completely out of time. You may also email us at moderator at aspenrmg.com for up to 48 hours after the webinar. This will be a one hour presentation. Questions and comments are very much encouraged throughout and the presenters will be answering questions at the end. And lastly, we have a number of upcoming webinars covering a variety of topics, including those listed at the Heffernan website. In addition, we offer the mandatory preventing harassment training in, three, in English three times a year. With that, let's begin today's webinar, Managing Difficult Employees, 15 Types of Employees Who Challenge Us. Our presenter today is Dr. Steve Albrecht, Dr. Albrecht is a trainer, author, and consultant specializing in complex HR issues and security concerns. He holds a doctorate in business administration, an MA in security management, a BS in psychology, and a BA in English. He is board certified in HR, security management, employee coaching, and threat management. He has written 24 books on business, service, leadership, security, and criminal justice subjects. Thank you for being with us today, Dr. Albrecht. Thanks, Amanda. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Amanda, I need to figure out how to do my slide switch over here. Actually, we have you on camera at the moment, so let's um, see if this will work. Got it. So you are currently on camera. Yep, there we go. Good coming up. Okay. And okay, should have play and we're ready to go. Thanks, everybody, for your time and attention today. Uh, good to be with you. Thanks to the good folks at Heffernan Insurance and also to my colleagues, longtime colleagues, probably several decades at Aspen Risk Management, and also to Amanda, our showrunner today. Greetings to you from the Ozarks. I'm in Springfield, Missouri, and uh, the weather here is delightful for a change, and it's a nice day to be with you together for this quick hour. So some of the things that we're talking about when we look at this title is Managing Difficult Employees, that is in the eye of the beholder. For some of us as managers and supervisors, it can be a, a real challenge with some employees. For others of you, you're like, ah, that's no big deal, and I deal with this person and, and don't have issues. So it's kind of different strokes for different folks. Some people have significant issues with certain employees, other people's not so much, and it kind of varies on a case-by-case -case basis. Some of the things that, that you're uh, sensing about this uh, issue is your time and in experience as a supervisor. Some of you have been supervisors for a long time, some of you not so much. Some of you had a lot of on-the-job training, a lot of, 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 of uh, support and help on the job. Others of you just um, went through some certifications, may have had some college experience, some graduate school experience, where you show um, some of these uh, tools and skills to the people that you're supervising. It also depends on the type of work you're doing. You may have remote employees that you're supervising. You may have field employees that you're supervising. You may have people that work for your organization or your agency that you see all the time or not so much. And what I'm asking you to think about is, A, kind of a bump up in your uh, coaching skills. And the other is the movement towards looking at these as not really judgments or kind of labeling people, but in uh, archetypes. 
And the concept of archetypes, at least from my perspective, is we look at the totality of these 15 people, the, the employees who challenge us, and it could be for different reasons, as to what our best practices are as supervisors, what's fair and legal and, and humane and ethical and within policy and within guidelines and how we manage and supervise them. And think about this in kind of a concept of how we think about uh, people from um, um, how they come into our organizations, 50% of what we hire them for is their technical skills. The other 50% is, is their um, um, interpersonal skills. And so think about that. We may have somebody who's really good technical skills, a, a great IT employee, a great um, process employee, somebody who knows how to build or make or create things or sell things for us, but their personal skills aren't very good. On the other side, we may have people that have great personal skills, get along with folks, get along inside their teams, can function quite well, but have a hard time doing their job effectively in terms of uh, performance, deadlines, quality of work, things like that. So you may have kind of a 50-50 issue with some of the people that we're looking at. It could be that they're quite good at their jobs, but have uh, difficult personnel, interpersonal uh, uh, interactions with people, customers, clients, taxpayers, visitors, vendors, coworkers, bosses, leaders, or they could have great personal skills but need some help in their quality of their work and they may need some training to get them up to full speed in terms of performance and productivity. You may have some employees that are on both ends of the spectrum, either really good uh, personal skills and performance processes and people that are not good in either and then kind of people are kind of in the middle. So when you think about the folks that are working for you now, is it a, a performance issue or is it a behavior issue? And I want you to think about two different things in our conversation here as, as we leave today. One is whether or not people need a PIP, that starts with a P for performance improvement plan, or they need perhaps a BIP, which is a behavior improvement plan. I work with people, especially in my role as a consultant for government agencies, who have a lot of significant issues about their behavior. Um, uh, sexual harassment, racial harassment, comments, language, uh, um, sarcasm, rudeness to taxpayers, rudeness to clients, customers, vendors, and to their colleagues. And that is not a performance issue, it is a behavior issue. So when you think about coaching, look at your coaching skills from a performance part of it or a behavior part of it. Which one is it that you are dealing with with these folks? So not only are you looking at who you have now, as an employee, but also who you may get or acquire in your career going forward. So who's going to be working for you downstream? So George Bernard Shaw said this so well, on the whole, human beings want to be good, but not too good and not quite all the time. And so when we look at what motivates people in organizations, it's more than just pay. And you know this already. People are motivated by how they are treated fairly and firmly and consistently and, and, and with compassion and empathy and dignity. People are motivated by being connected to the organization, connected to their, their, their culture, the work culture that their colleagues have created together. So there's lots of reasons why people want to work hard in organizations and lots of reasons why they don't. And we'll look at kind of both of them as we go forward. So I do a lot of work in government and, and public and private sector where we're looking at behavior and we're looking at performance. And I want you to see what we're talking about in terms of these 15 archetypes Again, not as judging people or not as, as labeling people. We're not labeling folks as being bad per se. What we're saying is there are behavior imp improvements or performance improvements that we expect them to make with your help, especially in the coaching process. And I'll talk a little bit about how coaching is defined, at least from my perspective. This is something I've done for many years. And one of the value of, of even with remote employees is the Zoom coaching process works pretty well. Um, coaching people, over the telephone works. You can coach people over email. And if you're really skilled, uh, you can coach people through text. Uh, how we communicate with people, especially younger generations, Gen Z, Gen Y, things like that, they may prefer uh, electronic coaching process with you, whether it's Zoom or telephone or via the screen, as opposed to older employees who may want that face-to-face -face interaction or may feel more comfortable face-to-face -face as opposed to uh, via the screens because they're not able to explain the context or, or see your body language and vice versa. So there's lots of ways to coach electronically. Uh, there's lots of ways to coach face-to-face, -face, which we'll talk about. One of the things we do in the coaching process is what we could call corridor coaching or walking down the hall. 
as we coach people. It doesn't necessarily have to be at your desk while they're sitting at the little chair while you sit in the big chair. It could be through a conversation that you have in a field situation or walking down the hall or over a cup of coffee where you get through to them what you think is important for either performance or behavior. And look at coaching in our conversation here as not a punishment thing, but a support issue. And that, that we look at our attempts to coach people as one issue at a time, not a hundred things to talk to them about per meeting. And that sometimes we give people homework in the coaching process. And homework is things, and I use that term in quotes, things we do at work. We give them copies of policies. We give them templates, cheat sheets, uh, booklets, reviews. We give them access to websites. We give them self-assessment instruments. We give them YouTube videos to look at. We give them uh, materials uh, to, to be caught up on that the rest of the team is already at full speed and perhaps they are not. So when you look at the coaching process, there's lots of tools that you can give to people as homework that the next time you come together and meet with them, they will have reviewed this, they will have studied it, they will have memorized it, whatever it happens to be. And again, they do this while they are at work. So our motto for the people that we're talking about in our conversation for coaching for employee performance or behavior, we can accept the person without having to accept his or her inappropriate behavior or performance. So this is kind of hate the sin, love the sinner kind of an approach, which says our personal feelings about this person are, are not what's important. Our, our interactions with this person to say, are we getting the best from them? Are we asking for their best? Are we coaching them in the right direction for behavior and or performance? Are we using structure like tools for their toolkit that they can ac actually apply starting right away instead of having loose conversations about, you know, be better or you know, get with the program, things like that. One of the issues I see a lot in coaching and talking to these types of employees is that we use abstract concepts to talk about concrete things. So when we say to an employee, you need to get here on time, that is an abstract concept. You need to be ready to work or logged on by 8 a.m. is a concrete performance issue. A lot of times we see coaching things sort of connected to fuzzy, puffy phrases that don't have any any context. So, you know, be better at your job is a is a inappropriate um, way to coach people because it's it's too fuzzy. It's not concrete. It's not operational. So think about the people that you have. And when you look at examples for things that you do not want them to do, you have to be able to put those in concrete terms. So instead of saying, you know, you need to be nicer to people over the phone, you go back and say, you know, I listened to one of your conversations with a customer, or client, taxpayer um, the other day, and here's what I heard, and here's what I'd like you to change. And these specific examples are back toward driving things towards a concrete change rather than an abstract, you know, be better, show up on time, that type of thing. So one of the things I look at all the time in coaching is what is the impact on the business? What is this person doing as an employee that hurts our business in a negative way? What are they doing in a positive way too? What are they doing in a good good way that supports our efforts to make money or save money or be the shepherds of the of the finances and the services and products that we provide? So what is the impact on the business is a overall overarching question you can ask yourself to say, when I look at this particular employee, are they hurting the business? Or are they impacting the business in a negative way? Second, and this is common with everybody, including me, we rationalize unacceptable behavior sometimes. You say, well, I'm not a psychologist or a, or a lawyer or an HR professional if you're not in that field. And you say, what am I supposed to do? And the answer is, you must address those things that hurt the business and impact the business in a negative way and are, are connected to either the employee's performance issues or behavior issues, where are there, where are there gaps in their performance or gaps in their, in their behavior. And so when we rationalize this stuff, what it says to the employee is it's okay, I can continue to do this. What it says to other employees is it's okay to get away with not good performance or not good behavior here. Again, we look at this third piece here. Are we looking at profiles or behaviors? The answer is behaviors. I'm not profiling anybody. These aren't value judgments. When I label folks, it's done in an archetypal sort of a way. Fourth point, peace or justice. What's our goal at work? And the answer is peace. We're not into punishing people. We're not into, into harsh discipline. We're not doing things that, that drive employees to, to feel like they are um, being targeted. We're not doing things that, that drive employees to go to the HR office and say that they're being bullied. Uh, which is a difficult phrase to define. But what we're talking about is peace, where we want success in the work and the quality of work, the performance, that part, and also peace in the interactions. People don't have to love or like each other at work, but they must coexist and get along together. That's what our goal is. 
Think about this, this uh, fifth point here, asking for help. Sometimes as a supervisor, you can feel uncomfortable going to HR or to your boss or to another peer supervisor and say, can you help me with this, this issue I'm facing? When in reality, our work culture and our organization should encourage people, especially at the supervisory management level, to share complex issues, to share difficult concerns, to share problematic people are doing problematic things. You say, you know, what would you do if you had this particular issue with your employees? What have you done in the past to address these types of things to get some help? That should not be a sin in your work environment. How do we align with people? This is again back to this idea that sometimes your employee may have better connection with you or may want to speak to another supervisor who could coach them up on a particular issue. And I've seen this a lot. Sometimes you may be coaching employees outside your direct reports because you have better rapport with them, better, better connection. You have a historical connection to them. It goes back, you've been together for several years in the organization. So alignment looks at how do we align with people based on the way that they see the world. And so if you have somebody who has a very extroverted personality, who's an employee, you may have to ramp up your extroversion uh, characteristics when you're talking to them. If you have somebody who's quite introverted as one of your employees and you're an extrovert by nature, you may have to slow things down, allow this person to absorb what you're talking about and not, not rush them with too much information. So that's what the alignment piece is in coaching, which is how do we connect, build rapport, talk about things that put people at ease, talk about people in terms of their own favorite subject, which is themselves, find that, that, that self-interest that they have and be able to talk with them about things that keep them in their comfort zone. I'm not into coaching in a, in a kind of a hard, harsh discipline sort of a way because we don't get compliance. We don't get people to go along with the process. Speaking of compliance, if we switch gears for a second, if there are no consequences for the person's behavior, the things that we're talking about here, performance or behavior, no consequences for their behavior or their performance, no changes for the good, we must enforce, enforce consequences. Otherwise, we're just having a chat, which is not what coaching is all about. It's not just a loose conversation. It has kind of a structure that says there's a beginning and a middle and end, and the end result of a coaching conversation is a change in performance or behavior, either a small one or a pretty significant one. So those of you, especially in the in public sector, we're not threatening people with, with uh, Skelly hearings and, and Weingarten meetings and things like that. What we're saying is there has to be an end point of coaching, which is what I call the PAM, or the personal accountability meeting, and we'll talk about this, it's one of the slides that says, this will be, employee, our last, and this is whether you have public or private sector employees, this will be our last coaching conversation before we switch over to discipline, I'm putting you on notice, if I don't see the changes I'm looking for. And I'm gonna go back to something which I stole from one of my lawyer friends, a guy named Glenn Kramer. Uh, Kramer is in Los Angeles, K-R-A-E-M-E-R. -E -E Glenn Kramer, really, really smart guy, uh, he supports uh, as a labor law attorney, uh, organizations only. He never he never sues on behalf of employees. It's always to support uh, organizations. And what he says is a coaching wrap-up conversation, which he uses every single time he coaches somebody, or he suggests that you and I use this every time we, we coach somebody, which is, and when we ask the coachee, we ask the employee, we ask the person we're talking to, is there any reason why you cannot fulfill the things we have talked about? Are there any obstacles that you see that make it difficult for you to make the changes that we've just discussed? We ask those questions to get closure, also to document the fact that we gave the employee the opportunity to say, I don't understand what you want me to do, or I'm confused about this training piece, or I don't know how to work this piece of equipment or whatever it happens to be before we turn them loose. Asking them those closure questions, is there any obstacles, is there any reason why you cannot do these things, is something you need to notate in your, in your coaching, coaching uh, files that you have had that conversation with employees so they can't say later on, I didn't know what I was supposed to do. Last thing, do we need coaching or acting skills during coaching? Sometimes we do. Uh, do we need patience during coaching? Sometimes we do. And how do we see proof of change? It may be gradual for some employees. Now, let's say it's sexual harassment and I've coached employees coming off of suspension for sexual harassment. And I will say proof of change for you is this is the only time this will ever happen in your career here and we will not ever have this discussion again or you're gonna be terminated, right? Sometimes we're looking at proof of change where we see gradual changes in the employee's knowledge about some technical processes or gradual improvement uh, in the employee's interaction with coworkers, team members, colleagues, whatever it happens to be. So these are the things we typically coach about. These are the things we typically will see embedded in the 15 people that I'm gonna to talk to you about, what we call the big seven. Work performance, that's quality of work, uh, meeting deadlines, things like that. 
doing their job. Violations of policy and procedure, you cannot smoke in the dynamite factory, for one example, right? Conflict with taxpayers, customers, visitors, vendors, colleagues, coworkers, supervisors, leaders. Attendance, pretty easy to document, right? Mismanages their breaks and lunches, doesn't come back on time, leaves for the day early, doesn't call in sick, things like that. Attitude, how they interact with people, their emotional sort of connection to the work, which is positive versus not, their service orientation towards taxpayers, customers, visitors, vendors, other people in the organization, and can they work effectively in teams? Now, let me back up for a second and say, some of these things that you see on this screen in terms of the big seven are abstract concepts, are they not? Teamwork is abstract, service is abstract, attitude is abstract, now attendance is concrete, isn't it? They're either here or not, on time or not. Conflict is abstract. Policies and procedures, pretty, pretty. I mean, uh, uh, violations of policies and procedures, pretty concrete, isn't it? Um, they did or did not do this in terms of safety equipment or, or some other procedures they're supposed to follow. And then work performance can be concrete or it can be abstract. Uh, they miss deadlines. They don't turn things in on time. The quality of their work is, is suspect. Those, could, they, those things could be concrete, but the concept of work performance is abstract. So when you look at this big seven, you must say to yourself, how do I take some of these abstract concepts and make them concrete behaviors? How do I focus on their service behavior? How do I focus on their, their conflict behaviors? And I use specific examples in the coaching to get them to stop certain things and positively to encourage them to continue to do certain things as well. I'm gonna talk about a concept called keep, stop, start. This is what we need the employee to keep doing because it's working, stop doing because it's not working, and start doing because it's a good idea. And there are keep, stop, start concepts and, and examples built into these big seven that you can use to make things more concrete, more operational. And I hope that makes sense to you. So I have talked about this book throughout my career, Crucial Conversations, this uh, collection of consultants here that wrote this book. They define crucial conversations, and this is, uh, I think there's a second edition that came out after the O2 version, but, but you can see this book, uh, lots of bookshelves on managers and supervisors. I often recommend it for uh, people that are in um, difficult uh, coaching situations where they're talking to, to people about uh, issues that meet this definition. Crucial conversations per these consultants says that 90% of the conversations we have with people, including employees or including each other, coworkers, peers, bosses, or in our personal life are routine, normal, and casual. 10% are, and we do fine with them, 10% are crucial, meaning the stakes are high for one or both party. Emotions run strong for one or both parties, or, and or opinions vary as to what to do. When you have these three elements together, high stakes, strong opinions, strong emotions, differing opinions, right? That is, by their definition, a crucial conversation, meaning that 10% of those where we need different tools for our toolkit, we need to pay attention to the fact that these are crucial conversations and sometimes we don't do well with them, right? Um, there's some really good YouTube videos that these guys have done. Uh, Ron McMillan is a kind of a gray haired cat. He's got a dark suit on and a green dress shirt. Um, he does a really nice, uh, about a 14 minute YouTube video on this concept. So if, if you're new to the crucial conversations piece, take a look at that YouTube video and I, I think it'll, it'll capture these three elements, high stakes, strong opinions, uh, um, uh, strong emotions in the crucial conversation definition. So for me, by definition, a lot of conversations we have with employees about performance or behavior are crucial conversations because for them, the stakes are high. It could be discipline or termination. For them, it could be an emotional issue or it could be an emotional issue for you as well. It could be something you feel strongly or angry about or upset about. And then the third one, opinions vary. There's lots of options as to what to do. Many of the coaching conversations we have are crucial. So we define coaching as a pre or post discipline conversation about performance or behavior, meaning you may talk to employees who come back from discipline, come back from being suspended, come back from, from a, a, a decrease in pay or a demotion or something like that. That's a coaching conversation about how they continue their jobs. But most of them are pre-discipline conversation, meaning we're not waving the discipline stick at them. We're not threatening them with discipline. We're saying, let's talk about this so that we can solve it as early and quickly as possible. Some people de define it as a series of conversations that help employees along their career path, meaning that we're helping them if they want to, and not all employees do, but if they want to, to promote. Third one, a way to identify skill gaps, solve conflicts, reward success, and make the performance evaluation process for you, the performance appraisal, performance evaluation process, the report that you write easier to do. 
Skill gaps is something that shows up in coaching where you say, this employee did not get the training he or she needs at the start of our, our employment here. Uh, they, they missed this during the onboarding, the orientation process, and it's a gap in their training. And here's the issue that sometimes we look at. Some employees will not reveal to you that they didn't get the training. Some employees will say, well, yeah, uh, no one told me how to use this, this software uh, program, but I haven't said anything because I've had somebody else do it for me. They, they don't want to embarrass themselves by saying, I don't know how to use it. And so part of the coaching conversation may be for you to ask them to demonstrate compliance, demonstrate success, demonstrate that they know how to work something that's a structural or procedural or process or, or technically uh, uh, driven so that you know they know how to do it. I've said the same thing when I worked in city government in San Diego, which is if you have to evaluate an employee about their driving skills behind the wheel of a vehicle or a truck or something like that, and you've never watched them do that, you can say, let's, let's get behind the wheel and make sure you know how to operate this vehicle so that when you do the performance evaluation, you're doing it honestly and accurately. So I look at coaching in, in a, a couple of ways. One is, is uh, the strategic or executive direction coaching, which is, is about senior leadership and the strategic issues that they're facing. This is stuff a lot of things my dad does. My dad, the guru, uh, my dad's name is Carl with a K, Albrecht. Um, he does a lot of this stuff in his career. Uh, the second one, career development, is really pretty positive, isn't it? It's helping the employee get to where they want to be if they want to promote. Third one is where we're kind of in our wheelhouse, which is performance improvement coaching or behavior improvement coaching. It may take training. It may have to bring up their job skills. Then we get down to corrective coaching, which is to stop doing certain things, sexual or racial harassment, um, attendance issues, things like that, where we're trying to keep this person from getting fired for things that they can address and fix themselves. And the last one, special problems coaching, is um, things where people have significant off-the-job issues. Um, I've done this for workplace violence and domestic violence issues, security concerns. People have significant health issues. They may need a uh, leave of absence, Family Medical Leave Act, things like that. That's where special problems coaching comes in. So kind of our wheelhouse for what we're talking about here is performance improvement with these 15. So again, I've had this, uh, this tool of Keep, Stop, Start in my toolkit for a long time. I use this as a facilitation tool for groups. What do we need to keep doing as, an, as a department or a team or as, a, as an agency, as an entity? What do we need to stop doing or start doing? I use this with individual employees as kind of a career path and say, what is, what is keeping you um, from, or what is holding you back? Those are things you need to stop doing. What are things that you need to keep doing because your boss likes it and it's good for your career? What are you things you should start doing? Go back to school, get certification, uh, transfer to another department to cross train, whatever happens to be. So I like this model because it, it's, you could even use it yourself. Sit down with an adult beverage on the 31st of December each year and look at your own career and say, what do I need to keep doing in my career because it's working, stop doing because it's not, and start doing because it's a good idea. This is a good team's approach and it's also an individual coaching process tool and it's also useful for self-assessment for yourself. So in coaching, I talk about the C's, communicate, clarify, and commit. And the two easy ones are communicate and clarify. You communicate what you want to the employee, you clarify with, with specific examples, and then you get their commitment. And that, of course, is the tough one. The, the commitment one, especially in coaching, is very difficult because employees will say almost anything sometimes to get out of the meeting. They will agree to things, they'll say, yes, I'll do that starting right away, and then they leave and they won't. The commitment piece has to be connected to a, a sense of accountability. The commitment piece has to be connected to some measurement that you use to say, yes, they are doing these things. So the communicate and the clarify is the easy part of the C's. The commit is the most difficult. Now let's talk about the sort of end stage where the coaching process has not particularly worked as sec successfully as it could, which is the PAM or the personal accountability meeting. The PAM, the personal accountability meeting, and you can see that the key phrase in that, those three words there is accountability, is where we talk to the person and say, look, I'm not going to scream and yell. I'm not going to beg you. I'm not going to talk about this anymore. This is the last coaching conversation we're going to have. I've asked you to make changes in your performance or your behavior. You have not. Uh, the next coaching, uh, the next meeting we'll have will not be coaching. It will be discipline. That'll be a written warning or, or whatever your discipline process is. And look at the last one. This is the Glenn Kramer speech. Is there anything that you any obstacles in the way that prevent you from making these changes? Is there any reason why you can't, you can't do what I'm asking you to do? Are there any obstacles that I need to know? Is there any gaps in your training or knowledge that we need to talk about right now? Because if not, I'm going to turn you loose, and this is the last time I'm asking you to make these changes in performance or behavior. The next one is a disciplined conversation. Okay, let's go through our 15. 
you may have some of these archetypes in your organization. You may get them at some point in your career. Um, let's talk about how we deal with each of these. Uh, the bully, certainly physical or verbal intimidation. Uh, physical size, rank, status, they use to demean each uh, other people. They do this sometimes uh, in, in public, in meetings. They do this sometimes uh, to employees in a, their own face-to-face. -face. Sometimes employees are fearful of these people. Sometimes they've been there for a long time and they bully based on their years of experience in the organization. Okay, the way you address this is you use examples. And you don't say stop being a bully because that is hard to def define that, that behavior. What you say is when you do these things, it makes people upset, it makes people anxious, it frightens people. When you do these or say these things, it hurts our performance and productivity here. It makes people wanna quit. They come to me and don't wanna work with you. These are the things I want you to address. And the bully is a tough one because sexual and racial harassment has been widely defined in terms of consequences and investigative process and support for victims, uh, but we do not have a parallel for workplace bullying. Uh, uh, a woman I know in Cal California and San Diego, uh, Catherine Mattis, M like Mary, A-T-T-I-C-E. Uh, Catherine uh, wrote a book about bullying. That's her, her um, organization is, is uh, Civility Matters. She does a lot of work in this area. She's a good resource if this is something that you are uh, facing in your organization. Speaking of, of uh, sexual and racial harassment, we have the, the, the sexual or racial harassment. Could be male, could be female, could be based on sexual orientation. It could be based on, on, um, uh, on political harassment, that type of thing that we see. Um, these are, one thing about this concept is these are behaviors that have been well-defined, well-documented in our um, business law, our labor law, our civil codes, our policies and procedures for private sector organizations since the passage of the Civil Rights Act in, in 64. So the good news about this concept is it's usually pretty well-defined in organizational policies. Uh, we have consequences for perpetrators, support for victims, we have an investigative process, and we have a, a, a well-crafted, most organizations have a well-crafted policy and procedure about this. And one of the things to point out about this concept is, is when we have harassers, that again, we use examples, not just you're a harasser. We use examples where we have heard or seen specific things, we've witnessed it ourselves, uh, we have heard what other people have said to us about this particular person's behavior, and we don't need to reveal who that was. When they say, who said I said that, you don't go, it was Mary down the hall. What you say is it has come to my attention. It doesn't matter who, 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 I'm not telling you who said it, unless it's a very specific example that you want to use with that particular person. So we look at the harasser and say, look, in the year of our Lord 2022, these are not behaviors that we will tolerate. This is 1952. We will not tolerate these behaviors. I don't care what you've seen on TV or in the movies or in what you've had in previous jobs. We will not tolerate these behaviors up to and including termination. So this is a, a concept where we say this behavior stops immediately. It's not a gradual thing. This behavior stops immediately or you're putting your job at risk. Again, focus on examples. So this is a tough one. The smart slacker. This person knows how to do their job, but they don't want to. They have retired on duty or they're missing on duty. It's what I used to call mod rod, right? Um, missing on duty or retired on duty means that their energy, enthusiasm, motivation is low. They could be burnt out. Uh, they've topped out in their organization. They can't, tra they can't transfer or promote to a higher level. Uh, they want to retire, but they don't have enough years or time to be able to. They miss the old days. I think that there's a couple things with a smart slacker. And the worst case scenario is they teach other people how to slack. And I, one part is that we look at the bottom there, we remind them of their legacy employee status. You've been here a long time. You know how to do these things. I want you to get your energy and enthusiasm back to be able to train new people, to be able to be a model or a mentor for other folks. And sometimes we can appeal to their ego to do that. If that doesn't work, then you have to say, look, I have the same expectations about performance and behavior as I do with you as any other employee who's been there for two weeks, as opposed to you being here 22 years. And we will use the PAM or the personal accountability meeting for that, for those situations where coaching has not worked. One of the things that we see the smart slacker is, and this is pretty common, where they put in for the same promotion that you did and you got the promotion and became a supervisor or manager and they did not and they don't like you as a result of that and they sabotage your work and they, they talk in front of you uh, to other people or behind your back about stuff and you have to confront that with coaching. You have to pull them aside and say, uh, I understand you have your frustrations about not getting this position. Uh, I'm not going to apologize for being successful. What I'm going to ask you to do is to help me and I will help you as much as possible but I will not tolerate you 
being disrespectful to other people uh, in front of me or about me. I won't tolerate gossip and things like that. You got to confront that that behavior, um, especially if you have that type of situation where they are frustrated. They did not get the position that you got. Okay, let's go back to kind of a little bit more interesting one that's sort of positive and a negative, which is the dolphin. And the dolphin is similar to somebody we'll talk about called the plow horse in just a second. The dolphin is above the waterline in terms of performance and then below the waterline in terms of performance. And then they do really well when you support and encourage them and coach them or you put pressure on them or you give them a fixed deadline. And then when you take those things away and you ask them to work independently, they stop. So dolphin means they're above the water and then below the water, above the water and then below the water. Um, you may have a situation where they're burnt out or unmotivated. Um, the plow horse is a, a kind of a similar person we'll talk about. But the dolphin is the biggest issue for us and these folks is consistency, that they are up and down and up and down throughout the year. And again, you need to give them specific examples where they were doing both. Here's where you're above the water line in terms of the quality of your work and, the, and your actions and your performance. Here's where you were below. Now. For people that are way below for a substantial amount of time, they may have some significant off-the-job issues, they may have some depression, they may be burnt out. Again, you're not being a counselor, but you may do some career coaching to say, is there anything I can do for you? You may make an employee assistance program or EAP referral. You may, uh, They may be a candidate for um, taking some time off. They may be a candidate for, for um, uh, retraining in another area that kind of gets their enthusiasm back up. What we see in the dolphin is they're typically enthusiastic about stuff they like to do, obviously, and not so enthusiastic about stuff they don't like. And so they focus more of their energy and their talents and skills and qualities on those things they like to do. And what we're looking for is more of a balanced approach, which is you're doing all the stuff, not just the stuff you like to do. So there may be some job reorienting, some job duties that are added or subtracted to, to make this person feel more connected to what's going on in the organization. This is probably my least favorite, uh, passive aggressives. And I've had some folks in my life that have been passive aggressive and they drive me crazy. I don't have the best skills uh, when, when working with these people. The passive aggressives are those folks that when you talk to them and you leave, you're upset, but you can't figure out why. Uh, when you talk to somebody who's passive aggressive, you, you leave kind of bugged, and, but you can't figure out what you're bugged about, but you have sort of a general you know, sense of uh, this, this person bothers me. Uh, they can manipulate lots of situations where you take the blame for things that are actually their fault. Um, I, I think you have to demand high performance. I think you can't let them win by going okay when they put you into that passive aggressive modality. I think you have to call them out with specific behavioral performance examples. Uh, there are folks that you work, work with who are kings and queens of this and they've been doing it since they were kids and they use guilt and diversions and all kinds of things and they act wounded uh, when you call them out for missing deadlines. They're, they're kind of similar to this next person I'm going to talk to called the champion. The champion is that person who points out all the injustices and the HR issues and the team problems and the conflicts and the possibility, although it's not usually true, uh, of sexual or racial harassment. They see it everywhere. They see injustice everywhere and they run to HR, they run to you, they run to bosses, oftentimes with petty complaints that really have no merit and it's a distraction. What is it a distraction for? Their poor performance. I worked with a lot of these people, especially in government positions, where they are the champion of the office, they run to HR, to you or to other bosses to complain about things and they, they see themselves as an entitled whistleblower, they're not, but they see themselves as a whistleblower. And when you confront their poor performance, guess what they do? They go back to HR and say that they're being being targeted because they're a whistleblower. So here's how you get around that. You go to HR first and you say, I'm having issues with this employee. He or she's quality of work is not what I want it to be. I know they have come to you many times. I'm writing them up or I'm creating a performance improvement or a behavior improvement plan. Can you review this HR professional to make sure that we're okay? Because I'm going to give this to him or her and they're gonna come speeding into your office and complaining that I'm, I'm picking on them, that I'm, that I'm targeting them. Uh, the, 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 cha the champion is successful when we don't confront their poor performance. And the champion is also successful when we don't say to them, I hear what you're saying, please go back to work. I've looked into what you're talking about. I don't think it rises to the level of a policy violation. Please go back to work. And the, the problem with the champion is sometimes we tolerate this behavior and it gets worse. And here's the problem with the champion too, is they, they create um, um, the silent treatment at work. 
people will come in and not speak to this person because they're afraid that they're going to run to mom and dad, run to a supervisor, run to HR about something that was said, some offhand comment about, you know, the weekend or the football game or whatever, which is harmless, but this person turns into, quote, something. So as a result, employees who are not, you know, uh, stupid about putting themselves or their jobs at risk will not engage with these people, will not say anything to them. So the champion will come in and they will say, no one talks to me. I get the silent treatment. People don't like me here. And one of the things you may have to talk to them about is, you know, your reputation for um, um, taking small things and blowing them up or, or gossiping about other people is what's created the situation. And that's what has to stop. Speaking of gossip, let's talk about gossip. I think gossip is something that you can address from a coaching perspective because it is about the impact on the business. And when I have come into organizations where this is really a big issue, the business impact is you got people not talking to each other. You got people who are trying to sabotage or have sabotaged uh, or been the victim of sabotage of personal or marital relationships. You got people talking about people behind their backs and it's like a computer virus. And I say to folks in the, in the, in the, sort of team building conversation, team building training is, look, when you pass around gossip, it's like passing around a computer virus. If you say to somebody, I'm not interested in what you're going to tell me, if it's not related to work, I don't, I don't wanna hear it, get, please get back to work, uh, or I'm gonna get back to work if you're an employee, then that's what can slow gossip down. But when we allow people to sit around and talk about each other without having management supervisor intervention to say, stop doing these things, it creates conflict, get back to work, this stuff's going to really go out of control. So I've worked in public government, fire department, police department, public works. Those are the ones that have a lot of gossip. Uh, I've worked in organizations where whole departments don't speak to each other because of gossip. I, I've consulted in organizations that don't speak to each other. And what I, what I say to folks is, you know, everybody likes gossip because it's fun and sometimes it's true and it's funny and it passes the time, but it also hurts the business. It impacts our business in a negative way. And you look at organizations that don't do this stuff, they're highly successful, connected, motivated team players. When you look at organizations where this stuff happens all the time, people leave, they quit, they get fired, it's not a fun place to work. I think you can address gossip as an organizational concept that is bad for the business. Psychopath, there's been a few books written about these cats. Uh, there are some books uh, written about whether you've had a, bo a boss who's a psychopath. Uh, we define psychopaths uh, differently than, than sociopaths. Sociopaths hurt people physically. Um, we have sexual sociopaths and physical sociopaths and murders. Those are, those are sociopaths. I've interviewed some of these cats in prison. Uh, a psychopath can be somebody who does not engage in criminal behavior. They don't hurt people physically, but they hurt people emotionally. Um, they lie. They manipulate people. Uh, they don't have a, a, a sense of empathy for anybody. Um, they're difficult to, to treat in a, in a psychological counseling perspective. Um, their uh, interactions with people are typically very narcissistic and driven by um, what is in it for them, what's, what's good for them. And so when we look at the psychopath, um, check out some of the uh, books and, and, and uh, literature out there about psychopaths in the workplace and see whether you see these things either an employee, you may have worked for a bosses like this. I, I had a, a colleague who was a psychopath, just a guy who had, had no, no pulse, no blood pressure, could hurt other people um, uh, emotionally and not feel bad about it. Um, difficult to know what to do with these people. The best thing you can do is sometimes is to identify them. The injustice collector is similar to the, to the champion. They believe that other people are out to get them and they're suspicious of the other folks and that they have a high degree of paranoia. And so when you say, would you like a cup of coffee? Their answer is, well, why? Right, well, what's in it? You know, and you go, it's coffee. Well, is that all that's in there? You know, that kind of a person who, the, their fear that the, something is happening to them, it's the worst. These people are really impossible to treat, kind of like the psychopath as well. I think there's two things that we can do for the injustice collector if you have this as an employee. One is let them vent. The second is point out where they are wrong, carefully, politely, so that they don't get this sort of conversational momentum about these issues. And then the third one is to look at how we treat them with, with empathy, because they're used to people, uh, their belief is there are people trying to harm them. There are people trying to, to ruin their careers. There are people trying to, to make it physically difficult for them to, to succeed in life. I think we have to, to be that beacon of, of hope saying, we don't do that here. I don't do that here. I don't allow that to happen to you. I want you to be successful as everybody else. And that's one way to address the injustice collector. 
the narcissist. Certainly, um, um, uh, we see it everywhere in politics and in, in government. I mean, these people, the world revolves around them. There's sort of two types of narcissists. One are people that are narcissists that harm other people. Uh, they like to they like to be narcissistic, and the other is people that just have really huge egos. Uh, the the interesting part about narcissists is that they are um, actually have very low self esteem, and this is all a dodge. Um, give them praise when they deserve it, but keep things in perspective. Use reality checks. And if their narcissism uh, sometimes can be useful in sales and performance and things like that, but a lot of times it can be toxic as well. And I think you, you have to pull them back and go, I appreciate your energy on these things. Um, there are other people in our team that, that are successful as well. I want you to share some of the, some of the, uh, the success and, as necessary, some of the blame. Sometimes we have people in organizations who uh, just sit there and they don't engage in group conversations ever. Uh, they'll sit in a group meeting and never participate. They get up and leave. Uh, maybe it's a language issue. Maybe they're very introverted. Maybe they're, they have been embarrassed in front of other people. Uh, maybe they were criticized once and never forgot that. Um, sometimes they are victims of, of somebody I would call an idea killer. Idea killer are people who shoot down folks' ideas in meetings. Uh, you cannot allow idea killing. You cannot allow it. You have to pull the person aside and say, we don't do that here. We don't shoot down people's ideas. We let folks brainstorm and talk about stuff. And the last one for the statue is when they do well, give them praise. When they do well, give them support. When they venture out of their shell, um, give them praise and, and, and make a safe environment for them to do so. Some people are just very careful with their words. Sometimes it's because they, were, they, were, they feel like they were victimized in some public way in an organization and they never forgot it. If they feel trusted, if they feel supported, we can get them out of their shell. This is a tough one, hygiene. Um, I do a lot of work in public government, especially for libraries, and library people have had to have uh, uh, this conversation with library patrons that come in, the hygiene challenge. There's sometimes um, some odd reasons for this. Sometimes it can then be because they are uh, depressed, but sometimes it's about revenge. They say, I, you know, I wanna, I'm, I'm bugged at my coworkers, I'm gonna do this until they, until they can't stand it anymore. This is a business impact issue. It impacts the business in a negative way. And look at the bottom there. We have what are called care fronting conversations. This is what my therapist friends call care fronting, which means we care enough to confront the issue. We care enough to confront the issue. We say, you got to come to work clean. You got to come to work with clean clothes. This is not a judgment that I'm making about your personal life. I'm just asking you to follow our policies about dress code and cleanliness. And if you have to make accommodations for this person because it's a health related thing, then we may figure out what we need to do in terms of you know, doctors, uh, certifications, that type of stuff. The challenger, the know-it-all is a really tough one because they dominate meetings. They're a close cousin to the idea killer. The idea killer is somebody who shoots down good ideas in meetings. And the challenger will challenge you sometimes. And I think what they want to do is argue with you in public. And they have a colleague, which I'll talk about here in a second, called the jokester. And this person wants to challenge you that you're, they're smarter than you are. Uh, they've been here longer. I think uh, you don't have to take the bait for that. But I would pull them aside after the meeting and go, what are you doing? Uh, why do you act that way? I mean, I, I'm not putting you down. I don't want you to put me, me down. Sometimes peer pressure can work in the, in the group environment. You know, someone will say, you know, shut up, Larry, just let him, let, let the boss talk, right? They love to publicly confront you or other people when they believe they're right, especially in a too loud tone. Uh, they're a close cousin to the idea killer. And again, this comes from low self-esteem. But I think uh, arguing with them in front of other people is a mistake. I think you pull them aside after the discussions, meetings are over and say, you know, th this is an example of a business impact issue that I don't want you to continue to do. I'm not asking you to, to demean them, but sometimes they have to be carefully uh, put back into their place so that they go, look, there's a reason we have titles and, and supervisors and managers. Somebody has to be in charge, and in this case, it is me. The jokester, again, uh, sometimes their jokes are disruptive and intentionally harmful. Sometimes they're racist or sexist, misogynistic. Um, I think you have to pull these people aside and say these are things you cannot do, but if it happens in front of other people, I think you call it out. I don't think you, you let stuff go when, it, when it's intentionally um, hurtful, racist, sarcastic, uh, wounding, mean, um, sexually harassing, misogynistic. I don't think you let that stuff go and to have a private meeting. I think you call them out publicly. And the reason you do that is you do not want anybody to think you condone this behavior. I look at the bottom there, we use extinction techniques. Sometimes for the jokester, if we do not engage with them, they lose energy. The minute you hit the ball back into their side of the tennis court, they'll hit it back again. You can go back and forth for a while. If they say some stupid joke and it's just you know dopey and, it's, and it gets everybody off ta task and sort of disrupts the conversation, 
I just look at them for a long, a long 30 seconds, nod my head, and then go back to work. Um, sometimes when they do things well, we give them praise. When we don't, when they don't do what we want, we use extinguishing techniques, which is we don't address it. But what they want is attention. What they want is attention getting. And sometimes when you hit the ball cap back into their tennis court, that's what they do. Okay, a couple more. We're almost done. The plow horse is somebody kind of similar to to um, one of the other uh, uh, people we talked about, which is the dolphin. The plow horse is not a behavioral problem, but they're a performance issue. And their performance is that they will only work on a project until they run into a rock in the field. So literally, they're plowing the horse. They run into a big boulder. They just sit there. They don't go around the boulder. They don't move the boulder. They don't ask somebody else to help them move the boulder. They don't get some advice or support about what to do. They just sit there. So you will give them um, a task and they'll call somebody and they won't get an answer and they'll put a file folder in their desk and never address it again. Now, sometimes this may be a sort of a behavioral pattern that was based on how they were mistreated by previous supervisors who said, you know, I don't pay you to think or, you know, don't be creative, don't waste our time and money. I just want you to do the task. And so that's all they do. You have to give them praise and also perhaps put them into situations where they can be successful, where you can give them praise. Nice folks, but when they retire, we find 300 half-done projects in their desk. The plow horse pulls the plow. The minute they run into a, an obstacle, they sit on the plow. Now, this next category of person here, this is my plus one, my 15 plus one, is your shining star. Your rising star, your shining star. Um, high performance. Interactive skills are great. Um, customers, clients, taxpayers love them. People like to work around them. They're supportive of each other. They're supportive of their team members. Now, um, a couple things. If you gave a project to a shining star and he or she ran into an obstacle, they'd work on it until the obstacle was done, unlike the plow horse. And the shining star knows that you have given him or her some initiative, some discretion to solve the issue. Now, two problems with the shining star. One is we can turn them into teacher's pet because they get all the fun stuff to do and not the stuff that people don't like to do. And the other is we can burn them out. Uh, you're in charge. Uh, while I'm on vacation, you're in charge while I'm at a conference, you're in charge while I'm out of town for a couple of days, we can burn them out. So make sure that we spread the work and we spread the praise to employees who deserve it and we don't turn these folks into teacher's pets or burn them out. But this is the goal of coaching is to move people towards this idea of they are self-initiated and that they work uh, alone uh, with energy and enthusiasm. Not everybody wants to be a shining star, not everybody wants to promote, we get that but we want to give people the opportunity to be successful in our organizations. Last couple things here. This concept came from my dad, Carl, about the coaching dynamic. My dad's a big model maker. And what he talked about was how we move from the left to the right in the coaching process, a spectrum of influence that starts with tutorial or teaching. You're teaching people what to do and how to do it. It may be technical, it may be performance, it may be policies and procedures. Then you move to more of an advisory role where you're just making slight adjustments or, or giving them feedback or, or giving them tiny course corrections instead of you know, making an entire change in how they do things. And at the end stage, and this could take two meetings or, or 22 meetings, it could happen over a week or six months, they're at the assisted discovery process where they go, I got this, I know how to do it myself, I know what I'm supposed to do. Let's talk about one more skill which is kind of a hidden skill. So we look at coaching as, as the primary conversation for these 15 plus the shining star. And the, the other one is the hidden skill of influence. So influence, and you may have worked for bosses who have the skill of influence. They don't persuade people to do things by yelling or telling, but by selling. Uh, they sell the, the future value of what we're working on. They sell the importance of the issue. They sell their trust in you. They sell their confidence in the team. And it's about building trust where you use your knowledge, experience, and intelligence to gently or boldly convince other people to follow your directions, to follow your lead, to follow your strategic sense of what you want to do, your operational sense. And it's known as walking the talk. So the tools of influence, lead from the front and the rear. Sometimes get your hands dirty, jump into the project to demonstrate you still know how to do stuff. Answer the phone, talk to customers, talk to taxpayers, talk to clients. Uh, leading from the rear says, let people do their work. It's not that you're a missing manager, but you're also not a micromanager either, which is you're a hybrid. You're in between. You say, I give people discretion. I give people the ability to do their work in a self-directed way, but I can step in as necessary and make some course corrections. We look at the skill of influence is not lying to people. 
modeling consistency, reliability, and patient, humane, ethical treatment of everybody, keeping your people informed, especially about stuff that they most want to know about, which is their own jobs. How does this affect me in terms of my promotion, my pay, my vacation, my benefits, whatever it happens to be? Don't give them, don't put them in situations where they miss things because you did not inform them as to what was coming up. Last one. Standing up for your people, whether it's in front of bosses or elected officials or taxpayers or customers, whoever happens to be, when it is the right thing to do. That is the skill of influence. So Amanda, back over to you. If we have any questions, happy to take them. Yes, we do. Start at the top. So I had someone ask, isn't it possible that the preference of younger people for digital Non-interpersonal coaching is counterproductive and can prevent exactly the kind of personal interaction that they need to practice in order to approve. For example, their lack of engagement and lack of understanding of others' needs and perspectives. Yeah, I think it's a great question. I think sometimes younger employees will use the electronic version of coaching, which is text or email or even voicemail or phone, um, as a cop-out not to be able to do the things specifically that we're talking about. There may be a, a, a context that's mixed, uh, missed in that environment. Um, sometimes you've sent text to people and they didn't get it. Um, they, they misunderstood, misconstrued what you were about. They misconstrued the email that you sent. Uh, my first choice, and this is probably old school me, uh, is always face-to-face. -face. Um, you get tone, you get body language, you get, you get in, inflection, you get context, you get the ability to fix things. I would say if face-to-face -face is not possible, then Zoom is the next best. At least you get you get eye contact and body language. Um, I would say the telephone would probably be number three. Um, coaching by by email and, and text has its risks, as you've said, is because people miss things and also they can maybe use it as a cop-out not to engage. And you know, their fallback position is, well, I'm an introvert and you know that's that's my preference. Well, me too. I'm an introvert as well. Um, but I have to be a situational extrovert, especially as I do my job. Uh, do you have any suggestions on how to handle employees with attendance issues since they have leverage due to the lack of staffing? Yeah, I think that's a, a big challenge nowadays that, that wasn't here at least, you know, two and a half years ago. And I think what, what you say is, look, we have expectations about attendance. I, I'm willing to be flexible. Um, you know, if there's work from home issues or split shifts or whatever it happens to be, job sharing, we can talk about some things, but I, I need you to communicate with me about what those things are. You can't call me, you know, five minutes before you be here and, and say I'm not coming in. So I, I'm willing as your boss to make some flexible account, um, uh, changes to how we schedule things if it's possible. Other times we say, you know, it is not possible and you have to be here. And I think that's the biggest collision. I've got a I'm doing a keynote for this large uh, uh, insurance group in, uh, in a couple of weeks here about the, the collision between work from home versus people that, that are wanting them to be back in the office, which is mostly the supervisors and managers. And they're getting a lot of pushback from the employees who say, you know, I don't see the need for me to come in. I can do this from, from home. And the answer is, okay, but we want you here for a variety of reasons. One is the teamwork. One is the communication. The other is that you're here to do things physically that we need you to do and there's no handoff issues. So I think you say there's a balance between my flexibility about their schedule and also what the requirements of the business are. And I go back to that issue again. How does, how does their being here or not being here hurt the business? What's the impact on the business? If you can manage it where they don't have to be there, low impact on the business, then maybe so. But if it's a high impact, high negative impact on the business for them not being there, then they need to come in. And sometimes you say, I can only be as flexible as I can be. Sometimes you just have to be here. Awesome. So I had a couple of people asking if they're going to get a copy of the slides. And I just want to let everybody know that, yes, there will be a, a, a link that will be sent out in an email after the presentation. So on to another question for Dr. Albrecht. Outside of delivering gentle coaching while being concise and clear, how can I better support employees that cry as a response of these conversations, those that crumble under feedback? That's a great question. I, I should have addressed that in this in this, and I forgot. That's a great point. Um, I, my thing about crying, and and you know, it's 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 important not to be hard-hearted. Is oftentimes I see it as a defense mechanism uh, where the supervisor will get flustered and say, "Let's end the meeting." And my, my th and I've had lots of people, male and female, cry in my coaching meetings because, not because I mean to them, but because by the time they get to me, things are, things are pretty dicey and their career is at risk. I will stop the meeting, let them compose themselves, give them tissue, say, you know, if you need to take a couple of minutes and, 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 and compose yourself, um, please do. But then we're going to come back to this issue. If you end the meeting based on people crying, they'll cry every time. If you end the meeting based on people shouting, 
uh, they'll shout every time. If you end the meeting based on an emotional outburst they will, and end the meeting, they'll do it every time. So what I look at is, can we be humane in terms of getting them get, get themselves back together? But I would continue to press on and say, I hear what's happening for you. I see it's an emotional issue for you. You know, that's where I talk about the value of the Crucial Conversations book, Emotions Run Strong. But keep on keeping on, because if you don't, what they will do is, is that behavior every single time. Um, how, how do you speak to an employee that continuously brings personal issues to work and lets it affect their, their work ethic? Yeah, I think a couple things. One, one is, you know, if you have an employee assistance program or an EAP provider, you say, let me make a, a referral. I don't need to know all the details, but if you're having some off-the-job issues that affect your work, uh, that's something that concerns me. I don't need to know the details, but uh, we have an employee assistance program. Uh, EAP counseling can be very useful. If you've been yourself, like I have, you can tell people it's, it's not voodoo, it's valuable. I think the other thing is sometimes you can reach a crossroads conversation with those employees and say, look, um, work is work and home is home. I know that they're connected, but when you come here, we have an expectation that you're doing what we're paying you to do. Um, if you need some time off, we can talk about that. If we need, you know, to change your schedule, uh, if you know, I'll make an, an EAP referral for you. Uh, those things can be all tools for our toolkit. But I have expectations here that you keep your home life separate than your from your your professional life. So we do have quite a few questions left. Um, if you've got a few minutes to stick around, I'd love to get through them. But, it's, you know, if everybody's got to go, we totally understand. So how much time do you think you'll have, Dr. Albrecht? I'm here for the next five hours for you. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. So like I said, to all the attendees who need to leave, we totally understand. And that's, that's perfectly okay. But we're going to try to work through quite a few questions. So stick around if you'd like to hear. Um, so my next question is, when starting a VIP, any suggestions for ways to ratchet up the seriousness of the coaching conversation without jumping to you'll get fired or navigating how to address where performance plans don't proceed according to plan? Yeah, I think one thing is to, is to, and I do this with both the performance improvement plan and the behavior improvement plan, is, is get it vetted by your boss and or HR. Say, let me let me write a draft and you look at this boss, you look at this HR and you say, you know, does this seem reasonable? Are we legal and appropriate and effective here? Uh, does there any language I need to change that's too harsh or it's, it's not specific enough? I get, get that vetted. And I think the second one is, is that is that you have to look at the totality of the coaching conversations for the performance or behavior improvement plans and say, you know, what what is not what is the employee not doing that I've articulated and explained to them? pretty well, they're not doing. That has to be in there. And I think sometimes employees have have blind spots for stuff they're not good at or they, they'd rather avoid. Uh, they're kind of hedonistic and say, I want to avoid this, this, you know, move away from uh, pain and towards pleasure in, in, in my work. And I think sometimes you have to address those things really specifically in the performance improvement plan and, and just stick to your stick to your guns and say that this is what it what it has to be. But get that vetted first from your boss or even a peer supervisor who's had the same type of issue that you've had and or HR to say, I, I feel strongly that, that this has been um, um, reviewed by folks that agree with my perspective. Suggestions on how to handle someone who belittles people, including their own boss and the boss does not correct it. Yeah, I, I think you have to look and say, is this somebody I can pull aside and say, you know, th this is an example of things that, that are bad for your career. It's bad for what we do here. It's not good for our work culture. It's not good for our environment. And you use specific examples. When you say my boss is a big jerk or whatever it happens to be, point that stuff out and don't just say, you know, be nicer. It has to be specific examples. Th those folks are really tough because sometimes if the consequences aren't, aren't, you know, they don't believe in consequences. They're not, they're not afraid of the consequences. They just continue and they feel like, well, it's free speech. I can say whatever I want. And I always say to people, yeah, you can say whatever you want, but there are consequences if you do. You know, you, you stand up in a meeting with 300 people and say, you know, this, this company is the biggest, you know, bunch of dummies I've ever seen. You're going to suffer the consequences. And I think sometimes people don't believe that there are consequences for their words. I've, I've fired people in my job as a consultant um, who, who have made workplace violence threats. And their, 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 aunt, their rationalization is, I was just kidding. And I'm like, that doesn't work now. You can't say this stuff at the airport. You can't say it in the workplace. It doesn't work as an excuse. And I think sometimes you have to go to the excuses or the rationalizations and go, those, those don't work anymore. So someone said, my challenge is staff who do not get along with one another and use words like harass or abuse from each other. Um, and they've tried mediation. 
um, and separation, but there's still a problem. Yeah, I've had a lot of that, especially in, in coaching, where physically um, moving the employees from away from each other doesn't solve the problem. Sometimes they look at how do we change their job duties or their work shifts or their assignments so they don't have to interact. You know, there's always that conversation that, you know, I said before, you don't have to love or like everybody, but you got to coexist. And some employees just can't do that. And I mean, it's just, you know, there's there's too much water under the bridge in terms of their antagonistic and animosity towards each other, which is really tough. Um, I, you know, it's almost like one person has to leave and that that's always the worst case scenario. But I mean, I think physical separation, job changes, shift changes, they don't interact with each other over even the smallest things. Um, I, I think those are the best things that you can do because sometimes, you know, there's no fix to the personality clash. There is not. Okay, so we have about seven questions left. Um, just want to let everybody know that if you have future questions, if you could just respond to the email that I'm going to be sending out after the mm -hmm. webinar, that would be a great way for me to be able to just forward it to Dr. Albrecht just in the interest of time. So um, I'll get through these last seven, but I, I don't think I can take any more after that one, okay? So here's the next question. Best way to handle team members who argue with you during chats or coaching, believing that they did nothing wrong? Yeah, I think, I, you know, you have to set up sort of behavioral boundaries. Say, I hear what you're saying. Let's continue with what I, I want to go back to. And I, I think excuse making and, and arguing is something that we see a lot in the performance evaluation, performance uh, appraisal process, where they will argue everything that you say on the, on the page, everything that you've said in the document. And I think one, one approach is to say, look, I, I see you have strong opinions, strong emotions about this. Let me get through my part and then I'll turn it over to you. But I'm not going to I'm not going to go issue by issue with you because it, it disturbs the flow of what I'm trying to talk about. I'll turn it back over to you sometimes. And I will say this to them. I may answer the questions that you have in the rest of my conversation or the rest of my discussion about what we're talking about. So give me the chance to do that. Then I'll turn it over to you. One value of that is, is that by the time you do turn it over to them, some of the energy is out of their out of their approach. And I guess this next question is kind of similar to the one that you just answered, but maybe you'd be able to elaborate a little bit more. They asked, um, what can you do when an individual does not realize, therefore they don't acknowledge that they are a bully or they have passive aggressive behavior? Yeah, I, I think, you know, some people are, lack insight is their own issue. We all, we all lack insight to a degree, but some people really lack insight. And I think I go back to examples and I think the examples have to be specific. You know, when you say you're rude to people, they go, no, I'm not. And when you say, when last week I heard you say this, this, and this to a to a client or a customer, and you used sarcastic language, that stuff can't continue. And and I'm going to define it every time I see it with you, and we're going to talk about it from a from a performance uh, stand or behavior standpoint every time. And I'm you know we're going to reach a point where you're going to start to make changes and stop doing these things. And and when I do that, it's it's it gives them less wiggle room. I think sometimes managers and supervisors use gray language and fuzzy language, which is not um, specific enough, and it gives the employee um, a sense of, well, I don't do that all the time, or, or they must not be talking about me. That's sort of that telepathic uh, coaching where you know a supervisor will come in and say, one of you has an attendance problem, and there's six people in the room, and they all look around and go, it's not me. I think you have to be very specific in coaching with people and say, these are the things, this particular example I heard yesterday or saw yesterday is what I want you to stop. Um, what about the one employee who challenges everyone, including the supervisor? Yeah, that, that's a, that's a pull, pull them aside thing and say, there's some energy that you have about this. Maybe I got the job that you wanted, or maybe you're frustrated about your current position. But, but that stuff, you know, it makes other people anxious. They look at me and decide what to do. I'm not going to argue with you in front of other, other employees unless it's, you know, they say something totally, you know, outlandish at the time, in which case you say, I'm ending the meeting immediately and you and I are going to talk right now. I've done that before. So I think, you know, we go back to lack of insight for some people. And also, I think there are some people that are eccentric. And they have personality issues, which are difficult to to navigate around. They're eccentric with other people, especially in their personal lives as well. And and their behavior off the job is kind of similar to their behavior on the job. It's a question of how much you can tolerate. That's a really good question. Um, sometimes during interviews, one of these these fifteen types of employees will come to light, um, and they're wondering which would you say is is a coachable or a low risk type of applicant assuming that they have the job and or the skills for the job itself. So you want to hire the person, but yeah. 
Yeah, I think it's a great question. I think the plow horse is really uh, coachable because they just they need praise. They they need permission to think outside the box. I, I think the ones that are really toughest, the passive aggressive is really tough. Uh, the the, um, uh, the 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 challenger is really tough. Sometimes they reveal themselves. I think also the 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 champion is a really difficult one on the injustice collector. Those are really the, the, the hardest ones. So the opposite of those folks, I think, you know, are the are the people that sometimes need more praise. Um, they need to be um, um, given more kind of coaching support early on and especially the onboarding process and the and the new employer orientation where we we set a standard of performance and behavior and we we welcome people into our culture but you know certainly the psychopath the injustice collector those folks are really really hard they're they're not they don't they don't do well in in you know psychological counseling uh they don't really don't do well in organizational situations as well they, they either make people miserable for a long time or they bounce from job to job what do you do when you have a bully who is the boss? Yeah, that comes up a lot. If you see HR articles and you see letters to the, you know, HR consultants and things and like magazines and websites, so that one's really, really common. And, you know, sometimes you say, well, if, you know, the short answer is, you know, quit and go somewhere else, it's not always possible to do that. I think, um, you know, if you can find a kindred spirit or somebody who understands what's going on, who's in HR, you can talk to the HR director and say, look, I'm frustrated. I'm, I'm you know, this person makes me anxious. Um, there are some qualities that he or she has because um, we can have female bully bosses and male bully bosses and uh, you know all the time as well. And and I want some support from you from HR. I'm not trying to backdoor this person, go around them, but I, I need I need to know that I'm doing the right thing. Sometimes you can outlast them. I've seen that happen many times, especially in executive positions, where, where you know the board of directors will not tolerate it after a while, and this person is is bounced out of the organization. I mean, worst case scenario, they stick around forever, but oftentimes they, they do themselves in based on that bullying behavior. How do you advise dealing with an employee that is citing health issues to be off work, but seems to make time for concerts, haircuts, et cetera? Yeah, you know, I, I look at some stuff related to um, um, Family Medical Leave Act or Americans with Disabilities Act, and, you know, I'm no lawyer uh, on this, uh, you know, labor law attorney or any kind of attorney, but I often say, you know, uh, we're happy to make accommodations for you about certain things if you have a doctor's note. You, we need doctor's uh, certification as to why we may need to make accommodations to your job, whether it's illness or, or you know, you're taking care of somebody at home, but we need, we need proof of that. We can't just take your example. And, and we enforce our, our uh, tennis policy. You know, if those things aren't in place, we're going to enforce our tennis policy. And we're down to the last question. So they have someone who is using their pregnancy and their, their mother brain or their mommy brain as a reason for forgetting or not being able to complete tests. So they're wondering what, what would you suggest? Yeah, I mean, uh, um, I think in that situation, how much empathy and patience do you have? And then can you extend it a little bit? I, I think, you know, uh, um, I know from my own wife's situation, you know, there was a lot of changes in her uh, energy level and her work performance, you know, when she was pregnant with our daughter. And I, you know, I think some, some empathy for that, how, how far can you go in terms of saying, you know, this person's got some other stuff going on in terms of, of, of their perspective of the world at that point in time, how, how much flexibility and empathy can we have? And just say, this, this too shall pass, you know, that when they're going to come back to full productivity, you know, as soon as they're, they're come off of, you know, maternity leave, et cetera. Awesome. Well, thank you for attending today's webinar presented by Heffernan. We will send information by email with instructions on how to access a copy of the presentation on our website. Thank you, Dr. Albrecht, for your time and expertise today. We hope all of the attendees found today's webinar to be a valuable use of time. Be sure to join us on October 4th for the webinar called Coaching Skills for Supervisors, Getting Employee Performance and Behavior Improvement One Meeting at a Time. Thank you and have a safe day, everybody. Thanks, Amanda. Take care, everybody.